Tonight on Need to Know, making the invisible seen and heard through art. How a local painter is putting the spotlight on our homeless culture to illustrate our common humanity. That's next. Also on the show, the impact and legacy of Rochester philanthropist Katherine Carlson. And we're introducing you to some of the women leading the craft beer movement here in Rochester. Don't go anywhere. An all new Need to Know starts right now. ignored and forgotten to seen, appreciated and understood. That's the transformation Richmond Foote Jr. hopes will happen with his new exhibition. The revered Rochester artist will showcase his new work in a one night only event later this month. The exhibit is called Out of the Shadows, making the invisible visible through art. The concept is to capture the spirit of our homeless culture in Rochester and to see those fighting poverty, addiction and mental illness as people and nothing less than that. I recently stopped by Richmond's studio to learn more. Take a look. Richmond, I understand that it has long been a dream of yours to bring art to our city's homeless population. And this really, the mission kind of came into fruition beginning in 2016. So tell me a little bit about the ways in which you believe art um, can have an effect on those dealing with you know, homelessness, addiction, and so on. I believe art can bring a sense of calmness. You tend to forget about your, your troubles because of the environment I try to create and just being involved in creating your, um, trying to create something that you're used to do when you're young as a child. When we, when we were a child, we always know we, would, we can draw and we're an artist. But uh, I try to create the environment where they can um, just be sense of peace, sense of get, uh, forget about their uh, concerns that day and their challenges for that day and just, uh, and just create what they, whatever's in their mind, and just to uh, have a sense of quietness. What do you think that it is about art that just allows that sense of quietness and peace to kind of come over somebody as they're working? I, art is like music. It transcends different cultures, different races, different nationalities. It just brings, because of that creative spirit, that creative dynamic that we all have. And that it's just, um, it helps to uh, cross all borders. We can just, it don't have to be no masterpiece, it just be something that you enjoy doing. Well, the past, in this past year, you joined forces with fellow artist Deborah Van Wert of Rock City Art, and you formed this weekly workshop together called Revelation Rochester, Revealing the Artist Within. Correct. So the workshops take place at both St. Joseph's House of Hospitality and also House of Mercy. Describe for people what takes place in these classes each week. Well, they love to come here because of the, um, the difference, the tranquility of it, and they they seem to use somewhat, for lack of a better word, therapy. Mm -hmm. Close to the hair that when you get the shadows. Mm -hmm. Okay. To uh, quiet the nerves, I've heard them talk about it many different times about how it just since it seems to quiet them down because of some t both places, they're, they're, it's really chaotic, a lot a lot of noise, a lot of different conversations going on. Sometimes there's loud, loud, uh, a lot of loud discussions <laughs> that isn't, isn't always peaceful. So they like to come, they like, they enjoy coming there, just the sense of, uh, because of the environment, because of the atmosphere, and just be able to uh, be childlike again. And, and some of them are very good, matter of fact. I have run to some very gifted artists that come to uh, Rochester, Rochester Arts. Well, we stopped by a class of yours last week uh, to meet some of the participants at Hard at Work and to see their work and to really hear their stories. And one gentleman uh, by the name of Michael, uh, he showed me this drawing that he was working on. And at first glance, it looked like maybe a landscape uh, drawing of some sorts. But when he started to explain it to me and the meaning behind it, it was clear there was a lot of symbolism and a lot of emotion attached to his work. My name is Michael and I'm a recovering addict. 
and just, re just drawing reflects about where I used to used and the uh, area I used and and how I mis mistreated it. And it's, it's going to reflect on my life from now on to keep me from using openly. I feel hurt. I feel depressed. And now I'm trying to come out of it by putting it on paper. You know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful that I can still remember this. Because a lot of people ha can't remember. You know, so um, this is me, my life square. And this is what I came, this is what educated me. And we used it to do our drugs. These are the benches we sat on, sidewalk we walked. This is the drug house looking at us. The first thing I asked was, give me a pencil. <laughs> Not a color and crayon or nothing. I'm taking it back to the beginning. And I say the same thing with my life. Now I'm trying to take it back to where I started from. And Richmond, at one point, Michael was in tears as he was reflecting, um, you know, on his life and the choices that he had made as he kind of was talking about his path of recovery that he's working to pursue. He said drawing that piece of art helped things come full circle for him. How often, I mean, is that a rare story for you to hear when you're in, in class and, and, and working with some of the individuals who participate? It's not that rare, but with Michael, he, he goes into detail and he's open. And that would, uh, that's what uh, surprised me about Michael. He was very detailed about what he did, how he did it, and he, he was able to go back to that uh, scene in, in uh, real life, but he felt very comfortable drawing it out in each a uh, simile had in there represent something that he did or something that he remembers uh, he used to do when he was in his, in, in his addiction. So now he can go back to that same area and just reflect and don't remind, remind himself you don't want to do that again. I think it's so powerful the ability to be able to do that through art. Yes. Because as he said to us, he said it was, it's a beautiful thing to be able to see where you are versus where you are right now. Yeah, it's almost like exposing it now. He's not have to keep it inside of him. He just put it down on paper and it's right there now. Exactly. Well, you have created a new body of work which is influenced by your work with our community's homeless population. Mm -hmm. And you'll be showcasing your new paintings in an exhibit called Out of the Shadows, Making the Invisible Visible Through Art. First, explain the meaning of the title. Out of the Shadows, to me, represents the homeless are in the shadows. Uh, you don't want to see them. They they're, uh, seem to be non-existent. I want to bring them out because they're real people with real stories, real backgrounds, and they uh, have challenges and they have loved ones and they have uh, future ambitions also to get their lives changed around. I want to bring them out of the shadows so that others can see them and see them for who they are, one individual at a time. So explain what will people see in this exhibit? Who will they get to meet? If they have it, I think it should open up the, uh, the, the idea they can try to talk to some of them. Get to know them, get to know them as individuals because uh, they have some remarkable stories. And uh, I believe we can uh, just expose them as real people, hu real human beings, and not just they are homeless, those people. They're not just those people, they're, they're real people. They're, they're God's people, just like we are all God's people. And I think that should remind us that keeping them in the shadows and keeping them as if they don't exist it's not helpful for them or us as a society. In what ways, I know you've gotten to know uh, some of the individuals who come to the painting workshop, some of their faces um, will be seen in this new exhibit. In what ways have, have you noticed uh, that the, some people have grown, have been impacted uh, by coming to these classes each week? For one, they were very proud that I was, would paint them. That, that's the first thing that uh, they felt very proud of. Then also, it's not just uh, leaving it in the art room. I get to know them personally. I like the way I have a little detail. I've even helped uh, one of the guys get his life turned around. I introduced him to uh, Action for a Better Community for a focus program that they have. He's went through the training program. Now he has a, a full-time job. He's able to take care of his kids now. He's able to uh, get back in life 
the life of the challenge of life, the real life, and not just in the homeless uh, uh, society. He's, he's going back to the homeless shelter, helping his other friends also. So he's he's like he's like uh, carrying the torch forward because it's, it doesn't stop in the art room. I want to see a holistic approach to these, to these men, especially the ones I get to know individually and understand how I can help them grow. What has been most rewarding for you working on this, on this new exhibit that's coming out and also through Revelation Rochester? Introducing them to Rochester. Introducing them to the city of Rochester to help them get that sense of peace, to help them change their life around, help them to uh, uh, get their own apartment, help them get a job, help them get them off public assistance, but get that sense of uh, worthiness back within the, each individual. And I feel very good that I'm able to help some of the men and ladies, but mostly the, the men, because I have a very strong relationship with a lot of the men uh, that I meet inside the workshop and outside the workshop. I understand that you and Deborah are working to kind of find a way to help some of these artists um, get their work licensed uh, mm. and eventually, hopefully, to sell some of their pieces. How important is that? I think that's very important. It gives them a sense of pride that someone else would uh, enjoy their work as much as they enjoy their work and willing to purchase their work. And with Deborah and uh, Rock City Arts, it's, it's, uh, it's another avenue to, to uh, showcase them to, to the city of Rochester and the world. Do not miss this one night only event, Out of the Shadows, Making the Invisible Visible Through Art, featuring the new work of artist Richmond Futch Jr. It all takes place on Friday, October 26th. That's from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Revelation Rochester Rock City Art Studios at the Village Gate. For more information, go to revelationrochester.com. Rochester is remembering the life and legacy of a longtime philanthropist dedicated to energizing our community. Funeral services were held this week for the late Catherine Carlson, who died on Thursday, September 27th at the age of 91. Carlson had a deep connection to Xerox founder Chester Carlson and his wife Doris. Together, the three financially supported several initiatives in our region focused on health care education, civil rights, and public broadcasting, to name a few. Joining me in the studio to describe how Catherine's life will continue to impact our community is Sister Beth LaValle of Sisters of St. Joseph of Rochester, Jennifer Leonard, President and CEO of the Rochester Community Foundation, and our very own Norm Silverstein, President and CEO of WXXI Public Broadcasting Council and the Little Theater Film Society. And welcome to all of you. Thank you yeah. for being here. Thanks. So I have heard Catherine described as a bright light, a tireless advocate, a caring neighbor, and a woman with great concern for her community. And I want to know, what was it that fueled Catherine's passion to serve? And I'll give that first to you, Sister Beth. Hmm. Well, I think, basically, Catherine comes out of a deep spirituality that includes caring for others and not holding goods, letting go of goods, abandonment, and. Uh, Chester Carlson wanted to die a poor man, and she followed many of the attributes of Chester Carlson in addition to having her own. So she was just a very caring person. Uh, she did not care about social ladders. She just very much cared for people and was very sensitive to people at all levels and very acute in uh, sensing out people and who was doing the good and who was doing the good for maybe different reasons from what she would do the good for. Well, all three of you had special connections with Catherine, friendships, work partnerships uh, for decades. And if you would, if each of you would, just share a personal memory of Catherine that you believe really best exemplifies the way she viewed her role in this world. And Norm, I'll give that to you first. Well, we are sitting in the Carlson family studio at WXXI, so she cared about public broadcasting. And she often told me a story about how she and uh, Doris Carlson were in London, and they were watching a, a show that they thought was just wonderful and should be on PBS. And uh, when Doris Carlson came back, uh, she and Catherine talked to my predecessor about uh, contacting these folks and getting the show for PBS. Well, it became Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> okay. So she has a long yeah. history with, with uh, public broadcasting. And I, and I could go down so many different things she's done for the station. But uh, she's done so much for the community. And I think that's what she'd like to be remembered for. Jennifer. And she had a particular love of libraries. The Community Foundation administered her 
uh, the Doris and Chester Carlson Trust uh, uh, over the last 15 years. And in helping her with that, we became acutely aware of how important libraries were to her. And I shared the Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie with her. And she later said that she found that inspired her interest in libraries in part because he had spread public libraries across America. And I, I read that dictionaries, like she was dedicated mm -hmm. to ensuring that kids in Rochester had dictionaries. Go ahead, sorry. That's right. She, she shared both books and yeah. dictionaries with students and personally attended to that work. Uh, that wasn't something that she delegated to the Community Foundation to send out a check. She met with students at RIT, at Nazareth Academy, Nazareth Elementary. Uh, she felt education was the key to improving people's lot in life, to economic development. Um, and she put um, grants from the Carlson Trust into working on that forever. And I can tell you how the dictionaries and another project she cared about started. So I am getting to know her and I am watching her, I use the word fiercely that uh, wasn't picked up, but fiercely yeah. be true to the Carlson legacy. Fiercely follow the, what Doris Carlson and Chester had set up in terms of fundraising. So one day I said, well, let's talk. And so we sat on the back porch at Daystar, which is where I had met her. It's a place we had have, well, for babies with special needs. So I said, all right, I've watched this. And here's Carlson this and Carlson that, and you've done this. What do you want to do? And she, it was very hard for her to say that, which again, I think is part of who she was. So I kept talking, talking, and I'm going, no, I'm saying you. And so she talked about her father's love for children. And that's when the Dictionary Project didn't start there because she saw a woman from Tennessee give books out on the street corners to kids, and that's when that started. But the, the fondest memory on this level is one of our sisters worked at the Brockport Migrant Program. So I called Sister Beverly and I said, do you have a need for books? So there the books went to the Brockport Migrant Program, but we would go out, and there she was, absolutely surrounded by these warm and loving children. That particular time they'd done family shields, and the family shields were all around the wall, and she sat and read to them. Now, she read in English, not in Spanish, read to them. And that's, that's who she was, you know, hidden and just immersed with these children, and they're loving her and her loving them. And they would continue to send pictures and things to her, you know, for a long time. So she very much liked that personal contact with students and also. But the, the memory, in fact, Betty from that program was supposed to come last night and say something, she's, you know, so maybe today she's coming, she, yeah. Catherine met inventor uh, and Xerox founder Chester Carlson uh, and his wife when she lived in Boston, and, and they became like family. And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, just a little backstory for that, but I'm curious, do you think that there is one particular thing that she was most proud of contributing to our community? I've, I've read and heard about a number of things, but is there something we haven't heard yet mentioned that you think was something of great pride for her? So much of her giving was anonymous because uh, she wanted to uphold the legacy of, uh, of Chester Carlson and uh, even this studio, it's the family studio, she wouldn't, let, she wouldn't let WXXI name something specifically for her. She always wanted people to remember uh, Chester and the great impact he had as the inventor of xerography and, and how much he did for this community. And she told me stories about how um, Chester s supported things like the United Nations, but people didn't know it because he, he was anonymous in, in his giving. And in, even here, when I look back at what Catherine has done for WXXI, XXI. She gave us our first gift that got our digital presence off the ground uh, probably 20 years ago. Uh, she gave us a gift to uh, improve our news operation, which has made us one of the leading uh, uh, public broadcasting news centers. And I could go on and on. Well, uh, there's one thing I, I read about and I, that I stood out to me, that she participated in a 12-week Citizens Police oh. Academy through the Rochester Police Department. And the goal for her was to have a better understanding of the duties of law enforcement. And I, I'm curious, what does that say about who she is and her character? She was bright. She was interested. She had a hu humility that um, you wouldn't have expected for somebody who helped put the name Carlson on so many critical buildings, including the downtown YMCA and the Carlson Library at U of R. But 
she also was struggling with how to address issues of need. A lot of what she did was through the Sisters of St. Joseph, which Sister Beth is part of, um, and their projects, but the going to the police um, training helped her interpret what she was seeing about relationships in the community. And, um, and she helped set up a credit union with uh, Sister Beth to address needs in the community and St. Joseph's Neighborhood Center, which provides health care to the very neediest people. So she, uh, I don't, didn't know about the police uh, training, but that's I know all about it. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 heard, I heard about it, too. Yeah, Betty, I think Betty Strassenberg was, knew about it. I don't know who started this whole thing, but they would go out in the patrol cars. There was also a shooting range program attached to this. And I remember her talking about they, they'd have to go out and patrol, literally patrol, sitting outside some apartment at Alexander Street and what was going on. And, and for me, this whole thing was she lived in one level for the most part, but she was not afraid to get involved in other levels. So when we were talking about her involvement with poverty, I mean, she never went to food pantries and did this or whatever, but she was totally comfortable. I remember when Rebecca Johnson, I got to know her and I wanted her to see the credit union supermarket and all that, and we went to Miss Betty's house. And she was just totally, and, and uh, Chatham Gardens. I mean, she, she was totally comfortable in these environments, albeit that that's not where her primary work was. And <clears throat> the thing I wanted to announce, which I'm going to announce tonight, so I started Progressive Neighborhood Federal Credit Union. And what I would say to her as I started my multiple projects, if I don't have enough money, could you help out? And she always said yes. Now, many times she didn't need to. But with the credit union, she did. Uh, and I have a, that's, that's a very long story, so you're <laughs> going to stop me on that one. But to make a long story short, um, she did keep funding, funding, and when, uh, when we it was formed on a wrong basis, but nobody told me how to start a low-income credit union. So it's the first low-income credit union in the city. And um, so uh, when we were taken over happily by Summit Federal Credit Union out of, uh, Summit, listen to me, um, Visions Federal Credit Union out of Endicott, um, I said to Frank Barish, who was in the head of it, and, and then the, the current, I'm going to tell about a phone call this morning about this, which I'm going to say tonight, uh, I said, this woman is responsible for your being able to take over this credit union. That could never happen if we're not for her. So this morning, so, so they have continued many of the mission programs that we had with Progressive. So this morning, Regina Seabrook, this absolutely marvelous manager who understands high business and understands people from the get-go, people that don't have a lot, called to say, um, the first thing she says is, you need to know the report came through. We are a $67.2 million credit union sitting right on the corner of Goodman and Main Street. That's number one. And number two, an angel loan fund. I said, Regina, I can't believe you're calling me today. She didn't know Catherine had died. She knew her, but, mm -hmm. so she didn't know she died. And I said, this is so symbolic mm -hmm. to be able to call to say that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, I don't even yeah. know what the topic was you're talking That's about, but I was so touched that right. I got that call this morning for another angel loan fund. So the faith community holds the money for the angel loan fund, but she ably administers it as she gives. I won't even talk about the loan she gives to what level of people that I didn't know about. So, well, I remember so, you, ta you told a colleague of mine, you said she was a woman ahead of her time, yeah, it's, it's especially it's in the realm gave, of philanthropy. That's the title we gave for the program today. And mm -hmm. She just didn't give uh, grants or gifts. She encouraged you. I mean, I'm sure that Catherine was one of the reasons you were successful. I would say she's one of the big reasons I feel successful here because having Catherine on your side really made the difference. She, she wouldn't invest in something unless she felt it really had an opportunity to give back to the community. Unfortunately, we have to close for now, but a special thank you to my guests for joining me and for sharing more about Catherine's legacy in our community. To learn more about Catherine and her service to Rochester, go to our website, wxxinews.org. Craft beer fans are on the rise across the United States, and the enthusiasm is certainly being felt here in Rochester. There are more than a dozen breweries in our region creating several local beers. While the terrain is dominated by men in terms of beer drinkers and head brewers, WXXI's Veronica Volk set out to find some of the women forging a path of their own in our local craft beer scene. Our first stop is Warhorse Brewing in Geneva, followed by Rohrbach Brewing Company in Rochester. Welcome to Warhorse Brewing. I'm Jen Myers, co-head brewer here. I'm going to take you around, show you what we do in a day. So first off, I'm the type of person if you tell me I can't, you can, I can't do something, I'm going to go, yes I can and I'm going to do it even better. And so for me it was really just more fuel to the fire. I was on a mission to really prove myself. I really wanted to pursue brewing as a professional level, but from there it took, it took a little bit of time because 
In this industry, you have to lift heavy things, and there was still, at that time, a stigma, I'd say, uh, about women being feeble and weak. So not a lot of people wanted to give me that chance because they were afraid I couldn't lift the weight needed to be. But, you know, I worked really hard and I got into a place where I have proved myself. I've been in this industry now eight or nine years and I've gotten to that place now where if I go to a master brewers meeting or a brewers association meeting, it's not like, who's this girl? It's, oh, hey, Jen, how are you doing? And what's even better now is I'm seeing more women coming into this field and it, it doesn't have that judgment that it, it once did. The one thing I always thought about beer is that it never held judgment and it was the common person's drink. There's so much judgment sometimes within some of these styles that are created and oh, it's not good enough. You forget why you're drinking it and it's to relax and enjoy and take a second for yourself. What does it matter if it's the next trendy thing is if you enjoy it, you enjoy it, you know? My name is Nikki Forster. I'm a brewer here at Rohrbach Brewing Company on Railroad Street in Rochester, New York. I got my first job out of grad school at St. John Fisher College as a residence director. Became an academic advisor, which I did for 12 years there. So I found myself actually taking a few vacation days from my job at Fisher just on a whim to shadow my buddy Zach, who was working out at the Buffalo Road restaurant facility where we have our small seven barrel system. One of the last days I was at the Buffalo Road facility, our owner, John Erlob, was kind enough to buy Zach and I lunch. He essentially said, you know, I know you've got a great gig going at Fisher. I know you're not looking to make a move, but we have a vacancy available. And we've heard lots of good things from Zach. Asked if I was interested in interviewing for the position. I think one of the great things is this is a, a pretty physical occupation. Whether you're a really strong guy or girl, um, nobody wants you to overextend yourself and, and you really take safety first really seriously. Ideas about bringing more women into the craft beer scene, I think through marketing towards women, I think shifting a little bit instead of scantily clad you know, models, we see craft beer is really for everyone, not focusing specifically on just the, the white male population, I think it's going to bring not only women, but minorities within the community as well to the, to the craft scene. And we certainly want and need that. And that wraps up another edition of Need to Know, Rochester's news magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight and throughout the weekend here on WXXI-TV. I'll see you next week.